G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as I take you through Round 4's version of True Footy Reacts. As most weeks are in football, Round 4 had plenty of action and drama and I'm here to take you through some of the more important talking points from the weekend that was. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and if you already subscribed to the channel and you haven't already gotten around our social media, do that as well because we're starting to do a little bit more stuff on Facebook and Twitter as the weeks go on. But without further ado, let's get into round four. Starting with the positive stuff of the round, and I think the Richmond Football Club actually deserve a fair bit of credit coming out of that weekend. Port were definitely the more fancy team going into this round because Richmond had all of Cochin, Martin, Rewalt, and Rance all missing. Dropping this game would have sowed a fair bit of doubt into Richmond's finals hopes. They would have been one and three with a whole host of players missing, and you probably wouldn't have blamed them for losing that game either. Nonetheless, they rose to the challenge. It was a really tough game, and that should go down is one of the better victories they've had in quite a while. Tom Lynch in particular really stood up as that sole key forward in Jack Rewall's absence and he kicked six important goals. Equally important though was the man at the other end of the ground and that was Dylan Grimes. Grimes ended up having 13 of his 17 possessions contested. He took five contested marks and he took six defensive marks in the back 50 in the last quarter. Both of these guys more than covered the loss of Rance and Rewalt on the night. Brandon Ellis was probably best on ground for the night. He had 28 possessions and a goal, while Jack Ross debuted and had an impressive 25 possessions. It probably won't be enough to get the Rising Star nomination ahead of Walsh this week, but it was probably a close second. It must be really pleasing for Richmond at a time where they're losing all these key players and guys like Sydney Stack, Noah Bolter, and now Jack Ross can come in and actually contribute straight away. On the port side of things, you have to say they'll reflect on that as an absolute missed opportunity. The power sit two and two after four games and with a bit more luck, they really could have been four and zip. Now they face a tough trip next week to West Coast in Perth. I mean, that was always going to be a tough game anyway, but now it's just got a little bit of added pressure to it. Now, one of the other big results coming out of that round was that the Giants claimed a historic win over the Cats at the Cattery. With the Cats going into this game in red hot form, not many people, including myself, expected the Giants to get the better of them away from home. The Cats led all day, and particularly in that first term, it felt like the Cats might run away early. But slowly and surely, the Giants started to work the Cats over and in particular really shut out Dangerfield after his really good first term. They do owe a lot of their win to their efficiency in that third quarter, particularly in front of goals. I believe the Giants had 11 inside 50s in that third term and kicked six goals four. They obviously managed to hold on for a huge four point win, which may be one of their best home and away victories in their short history. As we all know though, the win came at a cost for the Giants who lost Callan Ward early in that first term with an ACL tear. Some people just get rotten luck. ACLs really are the worst part of our game and my heart really goes out to Callan Ward. You you can see by his teammates' reaction, they really took it hard. Hopefully so. he gets a better run of luck in the future and we see him suit up in round one of next year. Round four also saw one of the worst Western derbies I think we've ever seen. Now Fremantle were quite undermanned, especially without Nat Fife, and they played about as well as you'd expect for a young team. Both sides had 13 inside 50s in that first term. The Eagles kicked five goals one and Fremantle kicked no goals and five behind, which ultimately was the difference between the two sides in the end. The skill level of this game was just atrocious and it's telling that this game had more turnovers than Gold Coast and Carlton the following day. It wasn't just a really good contested game. I wouldn't have said it really was a hot footy. The amount of unforced errors on behalf of the Eagles was just terrible and they actually looked physically cooked, which is really concerning for round four. At times, it honestly looked like they were running up and down the spot. They just weren't working hard enough. Now the Dockers obviously went into this game without Sanderlands or Fife and obviously Neil's not there either. But David Mundy worked through the midfield and turned back the clock and he was probably best on ground with 36 possessions. Andrew Gaff's presence in this game was always going to cause a stir and unsurprisingly he was met with boos from the Fremantle faithful. In response to that, the Eagles fans decided to cheer really loudly every time Gaff got the ball. Now there's a lot of salty people taking aim at West Coast fans for this, saying that they're somehow lauding him as a hero or that they're condoning his actions. Personally, I think the cheering of Gaff was purely to drown out the boos, which I think was a pretty good response. It's certainly better than getting confrontation with them anyway. Generally speaking, I think the support for Gaff really comes from the fact that he's an eagle and he's one of our own. And, and I'm pretty sure if a player at your own club would have done that, you'd probably understand what I'm talking about. I like to think nobody's trying to paint Gaff as some sort of victim or hero. I'm sure there is a minority doing that, but generally speaking, I don't think that's the case. One thing that really did piss me off though was the pre-game shit stirring where I think it was some dude called Nick Rin, I could be getting that wrong, made the accusation that Eagles fans are probably going to boo Brayshaw as soon as they saw him on the field. In my opinion, I think that's a bit of a pathetic attempt by this dude to try and discredit the Eagles crowd who he's clearly had a bad experience with. I know the Eagles crowd doesn't have a really good reputation, but he's basically trying to get people on side and condemn the Eagles fans before they've actually committed the crime. And you know what? It was completely wrong. No one booed Brayshaw. So whoever it was that initially made that claim, you're a bit of a flog. And so are all the media outlets for sharing it for that matter. On the issue of booing, honestly, I see both sides of it. 
I actually respect the right of Fremantle fans to boo Andrew Gaff, personally. If I'm honest, if somebody had belted Andrew Gaff, I would probably boo that player next time our teams played each other. Especially since this game was the first derby since that happened. In my opinion, this derby was okay to boo. The next derby is Fremantle's home game. You can tolerate some booing then, and I expect that to be the case. But then, maybe after that, it's probably time to all move on. Anyway, back to the positive stuff. This week's nomination for performance of the round has got to be Anthony McDonald tipping Woody. Last week, it was Jeremy Cameron wowing us all, and this round, it was Tipper who booted an incredible seven goals from 20 possessions. He wasn't the only one just from that game who had a standout performance, as the Bombers absolutely bludgeoned the Lions. But he's putting together a brilliant season so far, and as you'll see later in this video, he was our true footy player of the round. Also need to give a quiet nod to Collingwood's Brody Grundy, who apparently won 87.9% of the hitouts against the Bulldogs. I believe that's actually an AFL era record, with the next best being 77.8%, so that is incredible. As we touched on before, Sam Walsh has got to have the Rising Star nomination in the bag, and he'll probably have it by the time I upload this. He had 28 possessions, 7 clearances, and 119 Dream Team points, so he's really paying off the faith for those who got them in his fantasy team straight away. Walsh is really showing consistency beyond his years. After four rounds, I'm still very confident that he's a shoe in for the award. So now it's time to show you the leaderboard of our True Footy Player of the Year award. If you can't remember how it works, all four of us vote 5 to 1 on who are the best players across the round. McDonald Tipping Woody earned 19 votes for his performance out of a possible 20. Cripps and Bontempelli took 10 each, while Brody Grundy, Seb Ross, Lockie Whitfield, Tom Lynch and David Mundy shared the rest of the votes. Lockie Neal remains at the top of the leaderboard with 23 votes, while Tipper slides into that fifth spot. In addition to this Player of the Year award, I've actually been keeping a Phantom Brownlow medal, which, which I might actually start showcasing in each True Footy Reacts video. This one's a bit more involved. I'm actually going around voting 3-2-1 on every game of each round. As you can see on the leaderboard here, we have a surprise leader after four rounds with Jack Billings on nine votes. Billings was brilliant against the Hawks on the weekend. He got 34 possessions and that was enough for me to give him two votes behind Seb Ross. So far this year, he's averaging over 30 possessions a game and he's been a really important part of St Kilda's resurgence this year. All right, now it's time for my weekly shout out to the leader of the AFL Fantasy League and it is Deep Threat. Thought that said something else at first. Coached by a person who goes by the name Killer P, who is on 8,767 points. So congratulations, you're currently the leader of the league of 120 people. In terms of the footy tipping, Dave O'Gangel scored six with a margin of 10, and that was actually enough to be our best tipper of the round. So congratulations, Dave -o. However, we do have a new leader at the top of the leaderboard. That's right. It's me. I've actually taken the lead with 20 tips and a cumulative margin of 88. So, suck on that. If you're wondering how that is possible, I changed two of my tips from my last video, otherwise I would have only scored four last week, but changed both Sunday tips and thank God I did that. All right, guys, that's all we have time for for this week of True Footy Reacts. Sorry to say, I'm actually not going to be doing a video next week. I will be in sunny Bali. Yeah, but nah, just taking the miso to Bali, so won't be able to do a video for you. However, I'm excited to say we do have a podcast dropping this Thursday, hopefully, before I board the flight. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you haven't already, check out the Discord link in our description. If you go through our Discord chat, you can actually ask us questions for our upcoming podcast, or you can email us with the email address in the description. Anyway, guys, thanks. We'll see you in two weeks.